For the beginning of my speech, I prepared an allegory. The wind swept through that day with a cruel hand, natural and unquestioned. It was a fall day, the kind that whispers of winter's approach when a flock of large blackbirds fell to land on a large telephone wire. They sat there closely packed in, looking like a row of court judges in long black robes, and meekly hunched their bodies over, hiding their feet from the brisk wind, fluffing their feathers, and exposing their soft pink underbelly to the world below. A small yellow bird, singing cheerfully, passed the row by as it tweeted its happy tune. Another, this one blue, whooped and spun through the air, riding the wind fearlessly. It too passed the blackbirds by. At last, another arrived in its flight, small enough to squeeze its body on the last available inch of line next to the wooden pole it was connected to. Once landed, pleased despite the tight fit, it looked upon its neighbors. In imitation, it too tried to seek comfort for its feet by hunkering its own body down. But this only pushed its sides into the pole and the black feathered resident beside it. The bird maneuvered and pressed painfully down again and again, desperately trying to fit, until the larger black bird pressed against it squawked and with a sharp motion jabbed its beak into the small bird's head. Ouch, cried the little bird before it fell tumbling towards earth. Just as the bird neared the ground, it caught its situation, spread out its wings, and parachuted down the last bit of air, landing alone on the cold brown dirt. It shivered and shook its head, feeling bruised and dizzy. Upon the ground now, the bird realized it was standing in one large strip of shadow, and it looked up towards its left vacancy on the wire. The hooded birds had not moved or spoken. They simply stared, absent-mindedly forward, not straining their necks to even look down. They looked at nothing, and yet everything, as they sat tight together, feet hidden, eyes still, and glazed on that telephone wire. In a flash, the spot which the little bird had fallen from was suddenly filled with another. This bird was uniformed like the others, and when it landed on the open spot, without a word, the whole row of blackbirds shifted, pushing on their legs to stand, exposing their feet now and making room for the other so it wouldn't be pressed into the wooden pole. With this added weight, the wire now started to sink slightly, leaving a dip in the middle, and all the birds were squished ever more closely together. It was impossible to tell where one bird ended and the next began for they all blended into one long boa of identical black feathers and still heads. Seeking shelter from the wind, the little bird started to hobble around to a nearby tree. Feeling quite too sick to fly, and its fear of its vulnerability growing, it began its journey upwards, moving cautiously to not overdo its growing headache. The first branch it was to reach looked very high up and far away. With great effort and determination, the little bird crawled up the trunk of the tree, digging its small feet into the bark, and little by little, it rose and reached the branch. There, the little bird saw a grand perch just near the top of the tree, a flattened piece where two branches met, leaving an unoccupied spot. The little bird climbed once more, taking breaks on branches as it went, until at last, exhausted, it stood on top of the little perch. With the space it was given, the bird was able to comfortably hunch down and at long last cover its cold toes in triumph. As the comfort of height and the tree safely enclosing the bird from the wind eased some of the stress off its pounding head, the bird found its breath slow to a comfortable rhythm at last. The tiny bird looked forward now and spotted that same blue bird from before. It too had landed. It rested with another group of bluebirds on a nearby tree, all helping themselves to a small patch of sunlight, fluffing each other's feathers, and gingerly conversing, close enough together so the wind didn't drown out their voices. Suddenly, the little bird heard a different song. Soft singing arose, and it looked around the tree to see that same yellow bird from before, now sitting in a nest of twigs and mud, proudly displaying its gift to all who the wind carried it to. 
Feeling tired from its climb, the tiny bird settled its mind and body for a much-deserved rest. And as the bird started to drift to sleep after a tiring day, it looked up one last time at the telephone wire, which now seemed far away and shorter than ever before. The line was sinking towards earth more by the second, and the tiny bird realized it had started to sway side to side, shaking from all the naked legs, shivering from fatigue, and the harsh fall wind blowing by, whispering of winter's return. If you truly know me, you know the one conversation I will never resist engaging in, despite whatever present mood I'm in or however well you know me, is any discussion on a movie or show I've seen or a book I've read. When I was growing up, my dad would always flip to the TV channel that played classic old films. Now, when you're a kid and your attention span is used to bright colored, fast paced cartoons like SpongeBob SquarePants, the quiet back and forth conversations, or simply the black and white filter, would devour any chance of staying interested. Now, today, I actually will go out of my way to flip to that same channel myself. The movies not only exposed me to my true passion and appreciation for excellent writing, but also slowed me down and got me to see the genius, not in action or loud outbursts of sound effects or music, but from the very writing itself, which held these films and made them timeless. I began exploring awarded and acclaimed movies, musicals, plays, and reading countless classic novels. When time became an obstacle for my outlet, I made it into a hilltop class I created this year, dedicated to simply reading old classic novels and discussing them. Over the years, I've not only dragged one friend into forming a book club with me, but three, just so I could have someone to share conversations with on books which I thought deserved a moment in the sun, a moment where the author's writing got recognized and truly appreciated for their masterpiece, and now I realize in hopes that one day I'd follow in their footsteps. I remember in third grade writing creative stories for Mrs. Baborsi and loving every single line I put down in illegible large letters because I could tell, even from my own extreme judgment, I had a spark that was waiting to grow. Sophomore year, I learned I enjoyed poetry, a medium of writing I was the most unfamiliar with. Today, three of my poems have already officially been published, which makes me more ambitious to continue sharing my work. Lastly, you know the phrase, there simply aren't enough words to describe so-and-so. Well, I related to that for years, thinking that some things and feelings were so deep that they would never be described accurately enough or even remotely well from writing. In high school, however, for the first time, clarity finally struck me as every book we read through the brilliant help of Dr. Herring's explanations and passage dissections dumbfounded me. I was struck with awe that an individual could weave such truth of life and humanity, extreme depths of understanding the infinite, unanswerable themes of the world, and divine imagery from solely their alignment of words to create a well thought out and executed story. From these life-changing lessons, I started the first step to becoming better at creating because I finally felt I grasped the most valuable prin principle. Being able to recognize exceptional artistry and display of this craft, and bit by bit, understanding an author's intentions. I've developed such monstrous respect for excellent writing that today, I can't fathom how I could have found old movies boring. I'll never make that mistake again. Thank you.